Jesus said in John chapter 12, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's what Jesus said. And that's what we're trying to do here at Emmanuel. Hello, my name's Pastor Bob Gray, and I'm glad that you've taken the time to join us for one of our services. Our goal here at Emmanuel is to lift up Christ, to lift him up so high that no matter where you're at right now, he will draw you closer to him. That's our goal. May you enjoy the services of Emmanuel. And if I can be of service to you, please let me know. God bless you. Enjoy the service. John 12 is the result of a miracle working God. Please hang on every word with the book open, John 12. John 12 is a direct result of a miracle working God. The significance of John 12 is found in verse number 9. Would you look at this? Because this is what makes John 12 at the very beginning. Here you have in John 12 a man being raised from the dead and all of a sudden this ointment being, being, being poured upon the Son of God. But then the crowd starts to gather for one reason. Look at for two reasons. Verse number 9. Much of the people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see who, please, Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Here sat a man named Lazarus that just a few days ago was the focal point of the funeral service. His picture was down at the altar. It was his body that was now going to be put into the tomb. But hidden among the family's heart that Martha was the spokesman for in John 11 was an angst. It was that little bit of irritation. It was that little bit of mad. Here their brother was sick, and here their brother had died. In this miracle that happened in John 12, and the love that these sisters had for the Savior in John 12 was not the condition of the heart in John chapter 11. Here you have this miracle, and I'll tell you, every one of us want the miracle of John 12. Every one of us want to be able to sit someplace and with something that was dead in our life, alive in our life. Something that was gone for four days, something that stunk. If you know the scripture in John 11, Lord, by this time he stinketh. Everybody wants to sit at a table to where people sit across the table and look at your situation and say, so, so, so this was the wife you got back. So, so these were the children that came back. So, so like, like you used to be a drug addict. Like, like you used to be out of, like, like you, you, the stories that you tell at the table of John 12 are interesting when we find out what happened in John 11. The thing that makes Brother Hicks' testimony so powerful, because we're seeing him in John 12. We see him in a suit and a tie. We see him honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you get up, Brother Hicks, and you start telling us about John 11 in your life, I mean, hopping in a car and taking off with, his, with a girl who doesn't even know him, ends up marrying this girl, and, and, and now she has to put up with him. You see, listen, this is what we want. But you will never have a John 12 in your life until you travel back and you address John 11. In order for there to be a miracle of Jesus working, listen, there must be an honesty of heart between the believer and their creator. You see, Lazarus we find whole sitting with Jesus in John 12. This Lazarus who is being stared at by the multitude was not always this healthy, nor was it always this alive. You go back to John 11, verse 1. Would you go back there, please? And now we start finding out, and, 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 and I'm going to give my title here in just a moment, after we look at what has happened. John 11, 1, and this is a very famous story. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Look at verse 3, therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, look, look at it, Lord, behold, he whom thou, what, lovest is what, please? 
There was a pre-connect between this family and Jesus Christ. These sisters said, Jesus, you love Lazarus. We know you love Lazarus, and we need to let you know the person that you love is now sick. Now, now you would think, and one would think that just the mere mention of a, someone you love, someone you're close to, all of a sudden hearing that they're sick and there's no response. I want you to think right now about a family friend that you consider very dear to your family and that if they found out that something was happening in your family and you sent a messenger, text message, you sent a messenger, an email, you sent a messenger, voice, mail, and then all of a sudden you heard nothing. Surely this news would make Jesus travel the 15 furlongs immediately. Surely as soon as the messenger said, hey, he whom thou lovest is sick, he would say, all right, pack up, guys. Doesn't matter what we have going on. My friend needs me. We need to go. I love this family. I love these people. Come on, shut it all down. Call in sick. Let's, let's get, we gotta, we gotta go. You see, you and I understand when somebody is sick and somebody needs us, we got to go. But in this family dynamic with this person they loved, he didn't go right away. Two days he delayed, John eleven six, 6. And, but this delay was calculated. But to the heart, and we're getting into the sermon, please listen, but to the heart and mind of Martha, it was callous. It was rejection. It was our love for each other now. Now it has been put to the test, and we hear nothing? Like, like you don't even respond? Jesus said three things about Lazarus to those around him. He said the sickness is not about death, but it's about the glory of God. Lazarus is not asleep, he's dead, and I have delayed on purpose so that you might become believers in me. Now, this was the narrative back here. So when the news came on this side and they said, hey, Lazarus is sick. We know how much you love Lazarus. He goes, hey, we'll be fine. Like, we're not going to go right now. I said, no, we'll be fine. So the people on this side knew that everything was going to be okay. I'm bringing it down to your lap. But Martha and Mary here was like, how come we have not heard from the master. He has sat in our house. He has eaten at our table. No family loves the master like we love him. Why have we not heard from him? By the time Jesus arrives at Bethany, Lazarus was dead and in the ground for four days. Look at verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had laid in the grave. How many days, please? Four days. In these four days, a lot happened. The entire situation, I'm not, I'm not going to be as, as bombastic and out of control as I am. We got to get prepared for revival and don't let anything, don't let anything right now distract you from the next 20 minutes. The entire situation of the sickness, the death, and the grave brought about such a grieving process that it did not set well with the family, the fact that Jesus never acknowledged them in the moment they needed Jesus more. When Jesus did not respond to the messenger's news, he did not come right away. He did not prevent this death. Mary and Martha in these four days had to travel through a sickness. They had to sit by side the bedside of Lazarus, if I could bring it up to the 21st century. They had to listen to the chirping of the machines. They had to watch as the breaths got deeper and got further apart. They had to watch as he took his last breath. They had to watch as the machines were unplugged. They had to watch as everything was taken out. They had to watch as they pronounced him dead. They had to sit and grieve about the funeral home picking up the body of their, of their brother. They had to go and see the body prepared. Then they had to go through the funeral service. Then they had to put him in the ground. Then they had to order the headstone. Then they had to return to the house. And every other friend in John 11 came to the grieving 
except him. Mary and Martha made it through all these things without Jesus showing up. News comes, look at verse 19, if you will. John eleven nineteen. 19. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary he com to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, here we go, here it is, that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. You see, this is what was in the heart of Martha. Martha had to go through a situation. Without Jesus, you could have fixed it. You could have been. And now you show up? Before we get too on to Martha, there are believers all over Christendom that when they needed God the most to fix or prevent, they did not find God. Martha was very quick to point out that the one overriding fact that came from her heart, and that was this, if you had been here, he would not have been sick. If he had been here, we would not have been hurting. If you had been here, we wouldn't have gone through all this. Martha had the same ability that all humans have, and that is this ability. Listen to this, and, 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 and this is the sermon, this is the point. To move past hurt, but never recover from hurt. Move past it. Move on. But down inside of Martha, she never recovered. Martha was quick to express that one part of her that blamed God for the turmoil they just went through. But in the very next verse, if you'll look at it, Martha's hurt would not allow her to dwell on the past, but quickly switch to the present with the dialogue. Look at it, and this is what we do. If you had been here, my brother had not died, verse 21. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give it to thee. And all of a sudden, the pressure is put back on Jesus that says this, you weren't here when we needed you. But I can live in this relationship with you not coming through back there. But I know that you can make it right, right here. Do you know how many Christians live with this little thing in their heart that says, I can move on with you, God. But there is a situation back there that you could have taken care of, but you didn't. The title this morning is very simple. I blame God. Martha's hurt. She had cried all the tears she could cry. She had moved past. It's done. It's over. And once you hear the Son of God come, it's almost like the Savior should seek forgiveness from Martha. And Martha switches and says, all right, now that you're here, I know that whatever you ask can be done. You didn't come through for me back there, but that, that's fine. That's fine. And I'll tell you what's happening. There's a lot of Christians who have no trust in God because they can point back to a time that God did not prevent something from dying. He did not take care of the circumstance. They lost it all in death, but they are a good enough Christian that they can rise above it and they can say, okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. That was that situation. Can we just go forward? Okay, God, now I need you to do this in my life, and now I need you to do this in my life, and now I just need you to take care of this life. And, and, and listen to the response of the Savior to Martha, but look at how she was interpreting this. The response of the Savior to Martha, what, look at John eleven twenty two. 22, but I know that even now, whatever, whatsoever thou will ask of God, God will give it thee. Would you please... Look at verse 23. Jesus saying there, thy brother shall rise again. Let's put it in this vernacular. 
Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Do you know what Jesus was saying? It's going to be okay. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. All things are going to be okay. And don't you hate it when somebody has not lost, but you've lost. And they have this ability that this is the only verse they know. Are you all with me? They didn't lose their home. They didn't lose their future. They didn't lose anything, but boy, they have this pious ability to say, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Then they're called according to this person. You'll be okay. And do you know what Jesus was trying to say to Martha? You'll be okay. Your brother's going to rise again in the last day. And Martha took this stance. I know, I know, when we get to heaven, everything's going to be okay. And it's almost this angst that was in her heart, this thing that was in her heart that she did not solve. I'll say it again. There are some believers that have never moved past and recovered from the hurt that's back there. They have just accepted it. But the hardest conversation you'll ever have is with yourself about things that have happened that you truly blame God. We will never go forward in revival until we reconcile that which should never have gotten sick, should never have died, and God, you didn't come through for me. You didn't come through. It's an asundry of things. And I even hesitate to even go down a list which I have written out. But I will tell you this. Are you holding against God a situation that you went through that you grieved much about that caused you days of just being in this fog and that in your heart of hearts in trying to be a good Christian you say God, if you had just been God, this wouldn't have happened. Now, we're too good of Christians to say it out loud. We, we are too good of a spouse to blame God, so let's blame everything else. But ladies and gentlemen, if you can travel back through your life and all the situations that brought you anxiety, is there something in you that you quote with Martha, if you had been here. This would not have happened. The questions come all the time, Pastor, if God's so big and God's so mighty, how come he didn't stop this stuff? And if God would have just stepped in, I, I would have had more money now. If God would have just stepped in, I would have had my family. If God would have just stepped in, I would have had my church. If God would have just stepped in. And although we employ Christian principles, I'm going to ask you, what part of you, if any, blames God? I probably am preaching to the best group of Christians I've ever met, and I mean that. To hear your stories and see you still in church is amazing. But I have to confess, there's probably about five situations in my life That if I could have got away with it, I would have walked up and pointed my finger in the face of God and said, you could have changed this. You didn't change this. I'm not turning my back on you. But you know what I'm about to say. It will always be there between you and I. I'll grin and I'll smile and I'll do, I'll play the part, but you've got to know this. It will always be there. Please, I beg you, the reason that we can't trust God is because we truly blame God at times. We could have. We were close. You're only two miles down the road. You knew he was sick. 
You knew he died. You even got the obituary notice, but you never came. You never said anything, and now you show up? Okay, I'm going to move past that. But boy, are you on trial from this point forward. Y'all, listen. Revival will not happen in your life and in my life as long as there's any situation that we blame God for not taking care of. And I think we need to start this morning by getting right with the person that holds it all in his hands, and that's God. Martha, this, this, this interaction, look at verse 25. Jesus said unto her, musicians, if you'll come, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. I'm asking you this morning to do something pretty amazing. Apologize to God and get right with God about blaming him for something that went wrong. Take it back. Tell him you're sorry. Because listen, he is the resurrection. He is the life. And at some point, we can't go forward with an honesty of heart as long as there's that little bitty part that says, no matter how good you are to me, God, there's still that, that, that situation right there. You should have taken care of. Don't live in this pseudo, this fake Christianity. And I don't know who I'm talking to today. And I don't know if anybody's ever, if anybody's getting what I'm saying. But if you can stand here and travel back into your path and, and rewind your life, and if you can point to a situation to where you ever said, if you would have, I would not have had to go through, then that's blaming God. And I'll tell you the kind of Christian I don't want to be. I do not want to be that kind of Christian that I can't enjoy my Savior because I'm holding against them. Because here's why. How we hold against God for any situation, we now hold our friends to the same level. What are the two greatest commands in the book? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with what, please? All, right? And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus did not make a mistake by not showing up on time. Jesus was calculated because Jesus needed them to know. It's not what I do that's the game changer. It is who I am. And when you put all loss inside of who he is, he is a great God. Why do you need to stop blaming God? Look what happened, with, if you would, John eleven twenty eight, 28. When she fixed this with the Savior. When she fixed this with the Savior. And when she had so said, John eleven twenty eight. 28. And when she had so said, she went her way and called who, please? Mary. Her sister secretly saying, the master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into, into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Listen, the people around you are only responding to their God with that little bitty corner of your life that you hold against God. 
But the moment that you take care of it, the family will come to that place also. Mary is very clear here and is so spiritually insightful that Mary came up to where Martha was so that together Jesus could go with them. And there's a lot of family members that you, we wonder sometimes, well, why are they out of control? Why is this? And why is this? And why is this? I'm doing all this that I can do. But yet we do not understand that the true sentiment is sitting right there in the side. And that's why the preaching no longer affects. And that's why church has become a sleeping time. And it's become a time we just, we plug in, we plug out. When, when, when we can get done, when there used to be this time when Jesus was coming to the house, it was like, come on, he's coming. Let's just, come on, this is going to be great. But because he didn't show up when you wanted him, to show up and he wasn't on our timetable and how dare you let a son be born in my case how dare I come on really seriously if you are the God of all DNA and I'm telling you that if you and I consistently blame God for any loss then you've got to go back you've got to go back and go God on this point right here I just want you to know that I blamed you to some degree, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All of a sudden, when Martha found out who he was, she said, oh, I believe. She went back and got Mary and said, Mary, I'm telling you, we got them all wrong. And Mary came up. I don't think you realize how big your influence is on your family. I just don't think we realize it. And there's that void a lot of times in a believer's life. And if you're to ask him, do you blame God? No, no, I don't, I don't blame God. It is what it is. It's all going to be okay in the end. But only we know if we do. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, please listen to what I'm about to say. Boy, I would ask that we all be respectful at this moment. If you're here and you do, know not, do not know Jesus as your Savior, please know this, that every sin you have committed must be paid for. The Bible is very clear. The wages of sin is death. Somebody's got to die for what you've done wrong. Either you die as the owner of your sins and pay for them in hell. Or you accept Jesus. He had no sins. And when he died on the cross, he died in your place. He became all the sin that you've done. And those sins that you have done have already been paid for. You don't have to go to hell to pay for them. You don't have to die a spiritual death in a lake of fire. He's already paid for. This is called faith. And if you would just simply believe that he loves you enough, this is why he paid for these sins and that you don't have to do a thing. There is nothing you have to do. He doesn't want you to fix anything. He doesn't want you to do work to make up for something. He paid it all. And if you by faith come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm ready to accept what you did for me on the cross and you paid for it all, then you can have new life on the inside. Maybe you're mad at God right now. Maybe you really feel like God's not been good to me. If you're lost, God's been keeping you alive, sir. Ma'am, God's been blessing you and keeping you alive to bring you to the point to where you could get saved. But believers, listen to this. You may not respond in this invitation, but heed the words of the pastor. If there's any situation in your life that you are blaming God, God for not taking care of, then you'll never find revival. 
And if we're going to be open in our heart and let God do anything, then let's take them off trial. Thank you for being with us during this service. My prayer is always, as I study, that God would use his word to speak to people's hearts. And may you have a good day, a good week. Please know that if we can do anything for you here at Emmanuel, all you have to do is let me know. God bless you, my friend. Have a wonderful day.